Hello and welcome to this lesson on resultant forces. This lesson is suitable for the AQA Separate Science Physics course. Now in today's lesson we're going to look at how to link Newton's laws of motion to movement carried out by objects in the real world. Now the primary learning objectives for today's lesson are to state what Newton's laws of motion are, relate Newton's laws of motion to everyday life, and understand how resultant forces affect the motion of objects, which links into the following part of the AQA separate science physics specification. We're going to be looking and focusing today's lesson on what a resultant force is, looking at Newton's first law of motion, looking at Newton's second law of motion, and then finally looking at Newton's third law of motion. So, as we said before, we're going to state Newton's laws of motion, relate them to the everyday life, and understand how resultant forces affect the motion of objects. Now, one of the most fundamental principles of physics are Newton's laws, or Newton's laws of motion, which are the laws which determine how all everyday objects obey and determine it determines the motion of these objects. Now, these laws were published by Sir Isaac Newton in 1687 in his book, The Principia Mathematica, which is Latin for the principles of mathematics. Now, these laws explain all motion in the everyday universe. There are no exceptions to Newton's laws. Now, these are probably the most important laws of the everyday universe that we as humans experience. Now, these laws, unfortunately, don't work with the very small objects, e.g. atoms, so we came up with a new set of laws for them, which we call quantum mechanics. And they don't work for the very, very, very fast objects, such as light rays, so we came up with new laws for these particular objects, which we call the special theory of relativity. But every object in between that will obey Newton's laws of motion. So these laws of motion okay, determine the, the movements of all objects in the universe that we experience on the everyday as human beings. Now the first law is what we call in physics the law of inertia which is where all objects will travel at the same velocity unless it's acted upon by a resultant force. So fundamentally, a resultant force causes acceleration. Now we call this the law of inertia because the tendency for an object to continue at the same velocity, whether that be continue with the state of rest or with a uniform motion when there is no resultant force, is termed inertia. So basically, inertia means that an object will remain at the same velocity unless a resultant force acts on it. So a resultant force is an overall force on an object, so in theory you can consider it to be the combination of forces on that object. Now, this can be calculated by finding the difference between forces in the same plane. So in this particular example, we have 20 newtons acting upwards, as shown by the arrow, and we've got 10 newtons acting downwards, as shown by the arrow. So therefore, the overall resultant force is 10 newtons. Now, one force will be always considered negative, as it's acting in the opposite direction. Now, in this particular example, I have considered down to be the negative direction. However, there is nothing wrong with stating that upwards is the negative direction and your resultant force will be minus 10 in that particular example. Now just remember, this is a free body diagram and free body diagrams help you understand the values of forces. So the length of the arrow will help you determine the value and as you'll notice, the 20 newton arrow is twice the length of the 10 newton arrow. Now, the resultant force can replace the other forces in the diagram, so it's just as appropriate to say that there's one force which is acting with 10 newtons upwards on the object. Now, this is an excellent idea of why we use resultant forces, because basically we can replace all forces acting on an object with one singular force which has the same effect as all the original forces acting together. So again, we call that idea the resultant force. Now, as mentioned in Newton's first law, objects will accelerate in the same direction as a resultant force. So in this example, the object, which is a ball, will accelerate upwards as there's a resultant force upwards. Now, the second law is the mathematical interpretation of the first law, which is where resultant force is equal to mass in kilograms times by acceleration in meters per second squared, or 
n slash s squared. So this tells us that the size of the acceleration of an object depends on both its mass and the resultant force acting upon it. Now, this law indicates the two factors that affect the acceleration of an object. Now, firstly, it indicates that acceleration is directly proportional to the resultant force acting on the object. So if we plotted acceleration and resultant force on a graph, we would observe a straight line through the origin. Because a graph which has a line of best fit, which is a straight line, and through the origin, indicates direct proportionality. Now, acceleration is inversely proportional, however, to the mass of an object. Now, the full name of mass in this particular context is called the inertial mass. Now, the inertial mass is a measure of how difficult it is to change the velocity of an object. So the larger the inertial mass, the harder it is for an object to change velocity. The harder it is for an object to accelerate. Now, we can rearrange this particular equation and make inertial mass the subject, and we can say that inertial mass is equal to resultant force divided by acceleration, which means that inertial mass can be defined as the ratio of the resultant force over the acceleration. So the larger the inertial mass, the greater the resultant force you would need for the same acceleration. So the larger the inertial mass, the greater the inertia of the object as it will be harder to change the velocity or accelerate the object. Now, the third law is probably one of the most misquoted laws in the entire physics. Newton's third law of motion states that when two bodies interact, they exert equal but opposite forces on each other of the same type. This gives each object in the system a resultant force, so it makes both bodies accelerate. So for this law to work, there must be two objects in the system. For example, a person in the ground. Now, the forces produced are equal in size and in type. So they are the same in type, but they act in, on different objects and in opposite directions. So this law will produce the same resultant force on two different objects. So this, produce, this can produce different accelerations if your objects have different inertial masses. So just to clarify, the first law, the law of inertia, is that all objects will travel at the same velocity, which is called inertia, unless it's acted upon by a resultant force. A resultant force causes acceleration. The second law is that resultant force equals inertial mass times by acceleration, and law 3 states that when two bodies interact, they exert equal but opposite forces on each other of the same type. Now, to fully understand the implications of Newton's laws of motion, we must work out the different forces which act on the object. Now, to do this, we draw a free body diagram of the object, which is a diagram of an object with all of the forces acting upon it. So, in this particular example, we have a ball resting on a table, and you can see that there is weight acting downwards and reaction force acting upwards. Now, on a free body diagram, the forces are always drawn from the centre of mass. Now, remember in your diagram to clearly show the directions the force is acting in the direction of the arrow. So it's obvious to see the weight acting down and the reaction force is acting up. You can also show the size of the force with the length of the arrow. Now, in this example, both arrows are the same length, so they must be equal in size. And also, it's appropriate to show the type of force with an appropriate label. So we know the force acting upwards is the reaction force, as is labelled as such on the diagram. Now, from your free body diagram, we should be able to determine the resultant force, if there is one, acting on an object both horizontally and vertically. So in this particular example, we can observe the four different forces on, the, on this particular object, each arrow coming from the centre of mass of the object, and you can work out what the overall resultant force will be in both the horizontal and the vertical plane. Same for this example, and the following example here with the weightlifter. Now, the four rules should be as follows. Use a ruler and a pencil to draw your free body diagram. Use an arrow, where the size of the arrow shows the size of the force. Use an arrow, where the direction of the arrow shows the direction of the force and add a label to your force to indicate the type of force present. Now, 
In this example, our free body diagram shows a box on a table, so we can see the two different forces acting on the box. Now you can equate the forces to work out the overall force, which we, remember we call the resultant force, and a resultant force causes acceleration. Now this acceleration happens in the same direction as the resultant force. Now if there's no resultant force, as there is in this example, as reaction force and weight cancel each other out, this means there will be no acceleration. Now in this example, if we add values to the free body diagrams, we can work out the size of the resultant force. So in this example, we have 70 newtons acting forwards, we have 40 newtons acting backwards, so the resultant force is 30 newtons forwards. Now we can only ever do this if the forces are in the same plane as each other. Now we can say 40 is acting as minus 40 because it's going backwards. So we're deeming the, op the opposite direction to motion as backwards. Now if there's a resultant force, the object accelerates. So in this example, the car will accelerate forward. Now again, just to clarify, to accelerate, it means to change speed or change direction. Now the object will always accelerate in the direction of the resultant force. So just to clarify, when two forces are acting on an object are not equal in size, they are unbalanced and there's a resultant or overall force. The resultant force will make the object accelerate and the object accelerates in the direction of the resultant force. So in this example, the lorry will accelerate forwards as that's the direction of the resultant force. Now, we can use the free body diagram to determine the resultant force, but for objects in the same place, you've got to sum the forces together. But if the force is in the opposite direction, it's given a negative sign. Now, in this example, the lorry has a resultant force of 40 newtons in the forwards direction. This means the object will accelerate forwards. Now, this means it could change speed or it could change direction. Now, we can calculate the acceleration of the object using Newton's second law of motion. So, we can say acceleration is resultant force over the inertial mass. Now, we know from the question that the resultant force is 40 Newtons because the, the difference between 100 and 60 Newtons is 40. We divide it by the inertial mass, which in this example is 400 kilograms. So our acceleration is 0.1 meters per second. Now we've included units on our answer, and we've also given it to one significant figure because that's how many was given in the values of the question. Now, this fundamentally means that the larger the mass of an object or the lower the acceleration for the same resultant force. So just to clarify once again, that if the forces are balanced, there is no resultant force, but if there is a resultant force, the object will accelerate, change speed of direction in the direction of the resultant force. So, to clarify, in this particular lesson, if we have learnt, we can state what Newton's laws of motion are, we can relate Newton's laws of motion to everyday life, and understand how resultant forces affect the motion of objects. Thank you very much for listening to this lesson on resultant forces.